This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello and welcome to a very special Blood Red Podcast. And when I say a special Blood Red Podcast, they don't come more special than this. <laughs> um, for the final time, sitting opposite me is our full-time reporter, both home and away, James Pearce. How are you, Jay? Very good, thank you, Joe. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. A little bit sad. <laughs> a little bit sad to, to be doing this. Um, if you if you don't know, uh, you must have lived under a rock for the last couple of weeks. If you don't, uh, James is leaving the Echo after 14 years with us. Nine, eight or nine as the Liverpool reporter? Um, eight and a half. Eight and yeah, a half yeah, years. February, February 2011. Yeah, yeah. Eight and a half years as the Liverpool reporter. Um, he departs us on Friday afternoon. Um, so we thought we'd sit down and discuss... Um, your career as, as Liverpool reporter, you, you've got plenty of stories to tell. Um, <laughs> just just quickly, I mean, not a bad way to sign off your uh, last proper match as Liverpool reporter, watching them lift the um, the Champions League trophy in May. Yeah, yeah in, I don't, in June. Sorry, it was never 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 going to beat that. I don't no. think. Um, yeah, it's just a, a funny symmetry to it, really, because I, I I I got the job on the Echo initially as like a, a general sports reporter mm-hmm. stroke sub editor in June. Started in June 2005, so joining the desk, you know, probably yeah. three or four weeks after after Istanbul, and and moving on about a month after uh, Madrid. So yeah, in terms of you know, in, in terms of kind of going out on a high, I, it, uh, I couldn't couldn't ask for more than that. The the last match report being Liverpool crown kings of Europe for the sixth time. From Deltas to Believers to Sky High Achievers. That was, um, <laughs> was the way you signed off. I loved it. I thought it was, it was a fantastic. Was, is that probably your most the, the verdict that you're most proud of? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it was just, just only, only because it had been, it felt like, you know, it wasn't the most golden period, was it, in no. terms of, you know, like no shortage of drama. I mean, Liverpool is ridiculously newsworthy and there's never, ever a, a dull moment. But in terms of, like, proper glory to report on um you know I had been thin on the ground you know the only the only kind of victorious final I'd reported on with, with Liverpool was the 2012 League Cup final against uh against Cardiff and of course even that Liverpool made incredibly hard work of, of winning that one and so yeah after you know the, the the two obviously coming very close to winning the Premier League falling short in that the you know the FA Cup the Europa League what happened in Kiev um yeah, it was just incredibly special. It was actually a bit. It was a bit strange, actually, that kind of hour after the game in Madrid, because kind of you know I don't think it's any great secret. I was, I've always been a big Liverpool fan, so obviously the <laughs> fan in you, the fan in you wants to like just soak it all in, and and just there was so much going on after the yeah. final whistle with you know the, the scenes with Jordan Henderson and his dad, and you know the, what, the scenes with the fans and Trent doing his own kind of victory lap in front of the away end and mm-hmm. you, you know you didn't want to take your eyes off Klopp because it was yeah. you know that was you know you you know you'd watch an hour long DVD I think just yeah. on Klopp after the final whistle but kind of you, you, at the same time you're wanting to soak it in but you, there's a voice in your head saying the clock's ticking here for that deadline you probably do need to crack on and uh, and start and start typing so um, yeah but it was uh, yeah just I don't know, it's funny isn't it because obviously it, it wasn't a great game. It was painful. You know, I haven't, I've, I've not watched it back actually. And I don't, <laughs> I'm not really too sure why, why you would really put yourself through that. I think it, if I watched the second half again, I'd still be convinced that Tottenham are going to equalise at some yeah. point. Yeah. But yeah, the, um, I think like most people, when Origi hit, hit the back of the net there, just that, the, uh, the mixture of just relief and pure joy and the, that feeling of finally, you know, it's it's not another final match report having to be written about, you know, crushing disappointment and agonising near misses again. It was, you know, and it, it, also it just felt like that was such a massive step forward for the club. You know, it almost, going into that final, I almost was like, it was the fear of what would it do to miss out again. Good to see, yeah. And, and like, you know, that group of players and that manager, it would have been an absolute travesty yeah. to have come out of a season so good with nothing to show for it. So, um, you know, that made what happened on, on June the 1st, all that all that more special. All right, let's go back 14 years then. Um, when you joined the Echo Sports Desk in June 2005, what, what was your ambition? Um, I mean, it might have been, it might be obvious, but but talk us through your, your, maybe your mindset back then. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd been a student in Liverpool in like the, to the mid to, to late 90s. And, um, you know, my, my ambition was always to, to kind of go into journalism and I desperately wanted to get a job in Liverpool um couldn't do that at the time so I went I went back home to to Bath in the southwest and worked for the paper there for mm. for five and a half years and but I was always keeping an eye out 
you know, there was a, a massive ambition of mine to work work for the Echo, and then yeah. um, managed to get that opportunity in in two thousand and five. But yeah, like I said before, it was initially, you know, sub editing and and just a general sports reporter. So I was I was t- I, I kind of started off doing all the things that pretty much no one else wanted to do. So I you know I'd go down to Wavertree Athletics track and do the athletics and go and watch local rugby union and 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 do interviews with people there. You know, the gymnastics the the darts, um, just you know, things like, that. And, I, and I loved it to be honest. But yeah, yeah, the long-term dream was always to 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 get to write about Liverpool. But it was um, it was it was very different back then as well because you know Chris Bascom was um, was a Liverpool reporter then, and you know because obviously you know, it's, it's changed so much yeah. now with the the demands of, of of online and the shift from print to the, yeah. to the website that um, you know it, it tended to be at that time that it was only really the Liverpool reporter and probably the chief sports reporter at the time was Dave Prentice, um, who tended to, to write about Liverpool. Um, but, you know, I was able to learn an incredible amount from working with someone as, as good as, uh, as good as Chris. And then, you know, the, uh, you know, obviously Tony Barrett came, came after him that people would be familiar with. And it, it was kind of when Tony was the Liverpool reporter that I was able to start to do a bit, uh, more of the on the football side of things, and it was it was mainly really as a result of um, of what was happening with Hicks and Gillette, yeah. because um, you know you got like the occasional chance to fill in if someone was on holiday or whatever, or someone was off sick. But yeah. in terms of becoming you know an actual football reporter, it was it was around that time where I think you know certainly for for Tony and probably John Thompson who was sports editor then it was almost that feeling of it's just too much for one person. You almost need someone to cover the football and someone to cover the politics yeah, of yeah. everything that was going on in the boardroom. Cause you know, it was just crazy what was happening then. So, um, so yeah, that, that kind of created the opening for, for me to kind of move across to that desk full time and, and give up the, uh, the sub editing and the page designing. Yeah. Well, it wasn't just Liverpool you covered back then. You did do a bit of Everton. Did you yeah. enjoy that? Yeah, 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 but you know what? It was just the chance to do any yeah. the, any football writing, really. Yeah. So yeah, it was you know filling in and um, yeah, even did a couple of Everton European trips actually. Oh, did did, did, yeah, did one. Um, I think I did it for the Daily Post. And obviously, when okay. when when you they kind of pulled the resources and uh, when the Daily Post was still around, and I said, yeah, I did sport in Lisbon away, covering Everton and. Um, yeah, obviously kept my. I remember the first time, the first time someone took me to Finch Farm actually to be introduced to David Moyes, and uh, first thing he said to me was, "You better not be a red." And uh, <laughs> I just lied and said, "Oh no, 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 of course not, of course not." I, I need, I need, I need. I don't want to get off on the wrong footing here, but um, yeah, that was only a, a brief, a brief spell before I was able to focus solely on uh, on Liverpool. It's fair to say that um, your relationship with Evertonian soured somewhat. <laughs> um, talk us through. I think everyone in the office here will know about DVD Gate. And there might be a few Evertonians who, who re- remember it as well, but I don't re- think many Reds will know too much about it. <laughs> yeah, I, thought, I, think, I think it was kind of April 2013. Um, and, you know, yeah, to, to be honest, it, uh, I didn't really realise at the time it would, it would cause as much of a, a stir as it, as it did because <laughs> it's one of those things, that obviously, with the match verdicts, you know, it, they tend to be... They're roughly a thousand words, regardless of whether a game is finishes five all or or nil yeah. nil or or whatever. So you know, sometimes finding a theme to write about can be tricky. And that was a that was a Merseyside derby at Anfield where absolutely nothing happened. It was you know it was an absolute non-event. Uh, finished nil nil. I think I don't think either team really had a shot on target. And you kind of sat there in the last five ten minutes thinking, God, what am I doing? What? I think it was. I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, it might have even been Easter Sunday. It was around. It was, it was, a, it was definitely a bank holiday weekend, and um, and then literally the final whistle. Um, and in the old Anfield main stand, you had the press box right next to the director's box, and and Bill Kemright stood up and, and punched the air and, and said, "That will do us. That will do." And uh, and you thought that's that's a bit of a strange reaction yeah. to a nil nil draw yeah. against a pretty average Liverpool side at that time. You were in transition. It was the back end of Rodgers' first season. And I think that result actually meant that Everton couldn't get into Europe that yeah, that season. Yeah, um, so yeah, I think uh, at, at the time there was a bit of a running joke that Everton had a habit of bringing out DVDs for not the most uh, huge of achievements, sh- should we say? So I think yeah, I think the intro was 
expect the DVD to be in Everton's club shop on Monday morning. And um, and, I, and I thought, I knew it was, I thought it might ruffle a, a few feathers, but I didn't realise, I, I think where I probably, reg, reg, the only regret I've got is that I then went, probably spent too long near the top of that match verdict, getting a few more digs in when, I think with, with more experience under your belt, I'd have probably said to myself, do you know what? Liverpool weren't great today either. Yeah. And I might be better off focusing on what Rodgers needs to do to improve things rather than, than focusing on the neighbours across the park. But um, yeah, I took a phone call from someone at Everton um, very early actually on the, the following morning. I think it was a bank holiday Monday telling me I was a disgrace to journalism and that, um, <laughs> and that if they had their way, uh, I would be getting the sack. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably quite lucky in a way that Twitter was, it was, it was, it was getting big back in 2013, but it yeah. wasn't like it is now. Um, I mean, I don't know, it's just got absolute pelters, I think, because obviously then it got obviously cut and pasted and put on various Everton fans forums. Yeah. And it was, uh, yeah, I haven't really been able to, to forget that one because did you have to apologise for it? No, well, it was the um, <laughs> it was quite funny because the uh, I mean the, the echo ended up because obviously a lot of Evertonians complained. There was two a double page spread of letters in the echo. Yeah. Um, a lot of them accusing me of being drunk when I wrote it, which I thought was a bit harsh. It was uh, wait but no, no. <laughs> it wasn't. I can't even blame. It was a bank holiday I, weekend? Yeah, <laughs> I can't even blame that. But. Um, yeah, and it was quite funny. I, I won't I won't name names, but someone did say to me that um, here that they they'd actually told Everton I'd I'd, had a, I'd been given a warning just to kind of uh, try and <laughs> try and smooth things over with them because uh, they were uh, less than impressed. And I know I know. In fact, it was actually I think it was literally the day before Moyes it came out that Moyes was leaving to go to to United, and um, yeah, one of his one of his last acts as Everton manager was to ring up. The uh, the sports editor to to tell to tell him what he thought of me, which I can't quite repeat on a on a family <laughs> podcast, but it it wasn't particularly complimentary. And then even even a few years later, like I, I was in a taxi going back home um, to South Liverpool late one night, and you know as, as you did the you know the taxi driver, oh you're you know you're working late, you know where where do you? and I said oh yeah I work at the Echo, what do you do there? And I said oh, I'm on the sports desk, and. Uh, and again, I can't repeat exactly what he said, but he along the lines of, "I don't suppose you know that beep James Pierce at the yeah. Echo, do you?" And I, I just went, um, oh, "I've heard of him, yeah." And he and he said, <laughs> uh, he said, uh, "I'll never forget what what he what he wrote in that Derby match report about the DVD." He said, uh, "Make sure you tell him what I you tell him what I think of him next time you see him." So I, I just kept a low profile for the rest of the journey and said, "Yeah, no problem, mate. Yeah, I'll um, I'll pass the message on." Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, well, rewind a touch, touch more, and and tell us about how it felt when you got the Liverpool job. For a lot of for a lot of journalists, it's a, it's a dream job. Um, how did it feel for you when you finally got the job? And and talk us through those early days of doing the Liverpool job. Yeah, yeah just I think yeah, just pride more than anything else. I think I'd um, it was actually fourth time lucky because I'd um, it was one of those ones when 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 Chris Bascom left to to join the Nationals. Um, I applied then, but it was one of those ones where I applied then knowing I, I didn't have a cat in hell's chance of getting it, but it was just the chance to to show that, you know, that was your desire long term. And uh, and then obviously Tony Barrett came in, did a, yeah. a fantastic job. And then he he then obviously went off to the, the Nationals as well. And because I then did it for a few months whilst they were deciding what to do, uh, and I, did, I kind of did the pre-season tour of, of the Far East in 2009, um, you kind of begin to think, well, oh, actually, maybe I've got a chance. But then you, on reflection, you know, I didn't have enough experience at that point yeah. to do it. Um, and Dominic King, um, who did a great job, and he, he actually came across from covering Everton at the Echo yeah. to covering Liverpool. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was able to to learn a lot from shadowing him over over the next couple of years. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then, then after Dominic went, uh, you know, Luke Trainer was one of the news reporters here. He he got the job, um, and then uh, so yeah, at that point you kind of think oh, it's just not going to happen. You know, it's yeah. it's you know just one of those things. It's not meant to be. And uh, to be honest, I was kind of looking around for other jobs because I I kind of reached that point where you know that was that was the job that I really wanted. And when I missed out, then I probably you know I think you know, it's going to have to look at look at other options. And then it it came up again very very soon after and. 
thankfully that time I think I think uh, the editor Ali McRae probably just got sick of having to say <laughs> no to me, so he uh, he gave me a shot at it, and that was that was kind of late February 2011. So it was you know kind of six or seven weeks into Kenny Dalglish's uh, you know kind of uh, second spell in char- charge of the club, and yeah, that that kind of that made it even more surreal because he was one of my absolute heroes growing up, and. Um, you know, to to suddenly find yourself in a position where you're getting taken down to Melwood to be introduced to him, and he's giving you his mobile number, and um, and you're able to ring him on a daily basis. It was, uh, yeah, it kind of took a while for to me to uh, get my head around it. What was the club like at that time? Because it wasn't long into FSG's tenure, and obviously Kenny was there. Yeah, I mean, it was you know very different to what it is now. I mean, you know, it was just kind of battling to to try and repair the damage I think of the of the Hicks and Gillette years really and um you know still coming to terms with the fact that it had been kind of left behind you know and, you know it was such a you know playing catch up so so much and and then obviously the you know the disastrous reign of of Hodgson yeah. um you know Kenny having to pick up the pieces and and lead in a, a revival um on the on the back of that um, and you're right, I think, you know, new owners as well who are completely new to English football. You know, I think they'd, FSG will be the first to admit that, you know, that they made some mistakes early on. And, you know, obviously, you know, it was only probably a, you know, a year or so after after I'd been in the job that you know, Kamoli and, and went out of the door and, and Kenny followed and then you know, went down a different route with a, a kind of a young coach that they wanted to kind of really bring through young talent and, and untapped potential. Um so it was, yeah, it was, you know, it, there was a lot of work to be done. You kind of felt that, you know, the, there was, uh, Liverpool were a long way off back then, you know, challenging for the, the biggest prizes. What were the players like? Did, did anyone take you under their wing and help you initially on? Yeah, I think very, I was very lucky in terms of the fact that, you know, obviously the, the kind of the scouse heartbeat of that team, Stephen Gerrard and Jamie Carragher, and they... Um, They'd always had a close relationship yeah. with with the Echo reporters, and it's you know that that is that is a big helping hand because you know it, it wasn't that difficult to be able to to, to to at least you know obviously you've got a big job <clears> on your hands to then maintain that relationship, but they there was a willingness probably there on their part because you know of, you know their friends and family yeah. had that affinity with the Echo that they that they they wanted that relationship to continue from. From obviously the, the the people that had done the job before me, so um, so yeah, that was that 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 was a big helping hand, being because because also then I think when you've got two players of that magnitude in the dressing room and everyone looks up to them, when other players see them stopping yeah. and speaking to you in mix zones, then then that helps because the people the other players think well actually you know if Gerard thinks he's all right then you know if Jamie Carragher has got time for him then you know maybe I should make some time for him as well so. Um, yeah, that was that was a you know a, a, a big big help initially. The fact that um, yeah, two two players like that were um, were open to to the idea of uh, you know at least giving you the chance to to prove that you could be trusted. Um, and then it's all about you know, trying to maintain those relationships. Yeah, well, talking about relationships, um, you you mentioned before that you covered Liverpool a little bit under Benitez, Hodgson, Kenny, Rogers, Jurgen Klopp. Can you talk us through a little bit what your relationships were like with with those managers? Yeah, all very different, really. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, Benitez, Benitez was, you know, I, he, he was great in terms yeah. of, you know, he, I, he used to, when I used to be covering, obviously that was only when I was covering for certain people, but, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd go into a side room after he'd done this press conference and you'd, 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 sometimes you get five or ten minutes yeah. separately with him. Um, you know, and he was, you know, always, always, you know, Great, to, and you know, you really sensed his like absolute passion as well for the for the club, and you know the the absolute opposite really of then what followed with Hodgson, which was you know car crash stuff. To be honest, in terms of a manager that just didn't get Liverpool Football Club, never seemed to appreciate what what had, had fallen into his lap, and, and managed to you know score own goal after own goal, PR wise, with <laughs> yeah. some of the. You know, I lost count of the number of times you'd you'd be sat there and just think, oh my god, you know, how can you, you know, that I remember, I think it was Henry Winter actually in the old, at post match in the old main stand at Anfield, kind of it was a rare home win under Hodgson, and and saying to to Roy in the post match press conference, you know, Roy, when when Anfield's rocking like it was here tonight, you know, is there anywhere better in world football? 
And he kind of like took a deep breath and went, San Siro's excellent. Old Trafford can be very good. And he's just like, for God's sake, come on, like just help yourself out yeah, here. Yeah. And, you know, and then you know, I remember being at Old Trafford and when it was put to him that Ferguson had just been on MUTV calling Torres a diver. And, and his response was that, you know, maybe Sir Alex had a better view of it than I did. And so that was, you know, that was a, that was a painful period where I was, I was quite glad that I wasn't in a position yeah. where I was having to try and try and deal with him on a, on a daily basis. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, Kenny was, you know, that, that was like a massive thrill to, to speak. The, the funny thing with Kenny was that as everyone knows, he's very, he, he just doesn't give much away. So that was, that, that actually became really hard in terms of you'd get like a separate five or 10 minutes with him, but you were trying to get two or three pieces out of it. And he just, he just wouldn't bite on that, on anything. You know, it was, yeah. it was, so then obviously, and when you're new to the job, you're, you're trying to impress and you're coming back to the office. And I must admit, there was a lot of times I was coming back to the office, pretty fearful thinking, God, you know, how, how the hell am I going to try and get a couple of, couple of preview pieces out of this when no matter what kind of player or you put to him, it was, uh, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't go into a huge amount of detail on his, on his answers and he, you know even like I remember there was a number of times they'd be sat in the corner on the phone to him for 20 minutes 25 minutes and you could see the sports editor looking across thinking oh, you know, that's really promising like yeah. you know you, we can have a decent back page tomorrow and then coming off the phone looking at your notes and thinking <laughs> there's, 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 there's nothing there you know a lot, a lot of it was you know, sometimes he'd, you know, he'd be, he'd be help asking for my help trying to find Eurosport on his TV and stuff like that with his <laughs> sky control and the the uh, but you know, he was no, he was he was brilliant, Kenny. And then Rogers, uh, you know, Rogers is probably the one I had the best access with. Yeah. Um, again, because you know all managers are different. I think the thing with Rogers when he came in, you know, he was very clever because he knew that he kind of needed allies because mm. you know he wasn't Kenny Dogleach, he wasn't that iconic figure. Um, you know, he was effectively, you know, he needed friends. Really, I think he, he knew that there was a lot of people that didn't want him because you know there, there was people that think thought that you know Kenny shouldn't have gone other yeah. people that wanted Benitez back you know, and very unproven so um you know from the start well and I think also the fact that Rogers got maybe the difference sometimes between local newspapers and national newspapers he kind of you know he, he'd had that relationship with the paper down in Swansea yeah. and wanted it to be maintained with the echo and that you know in, in terms of being able to do the job that was that was probably you know, a really, really enjoyable period because, you know, access was great. You were in a position where you could, you could ask him things, you know, off the record, you know, on the record, you know, I think everyone knows Rogers is, a, you know, a, whatever you think of him, he's a great talker and, you know, he's ne never short of giving a few quotes. Um, so, uh, so yeah, you know, in a position where I think usually every Thursday I'd, I'd go down to Melwood and have 30, 40 minutes in his office with him before he did his press conference and, so yeah, when when you're trying to stay on top of everything, you know that is just absolutely invaluable. Um, it went, it, it kind of soured a little bit towards the end under Rogers. Not surprisingly, because you, know, you obviously you get accused of you know having agendas and yeah. and all sorts. And but it was you know, as a result went off a cliff. You know, culminating obviously in that six-one defeat at Stoke. You know, he felt that the, the coverage had been too critical. Yeah. Um, so it was a bit bizarre. Even that that the kind of the last kind of five or six months of his reign where, you know, all, all that kind of one-to-one -one access was effectively cut off. Um, yeah, you kind of, you're still getting accused of being in his pocket, even yeah. though, <laughs> even though I, there was actually, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd effectively said, no, that's it. You've been too critical. Yeah. You're then getting it from elsewhere for saying you're not being critical enough. So, yeah. um, but um, no, he was, a, he was a good guy, Brendan. I'm yeah, pleased to see him doing, doing well at Leicester. I think, I, I always felt sorry for Rogers, just in terms of, I felt, I think he was 38 or 39 when he got the Liverpool job. That's so young, yeah. especially as someone who didn't have a massive bulging CV of honours. And I know people said, you know, well, he's you know, arrogant or too big for his boots or whatever, but you've got, you, you have to have, you know, I think you know, it's very difficult coming into a, a club of Liverpool's stature. And I, I think you, know, you you have to try and be you know like this big personality or big presence to try and make your your kind of your presence felt if you like so um and, and also you know i i feel it's unfair on him some of the rewriting of history that goes on with 2013 yeah. 14 and people saying that you know that was just suarez and suarez made him look like a decent manager because 
know, anyone who went to those games will, will tell you there was so much more to admire yeah. that Liverpool team than that. You know, the way he got the best out of Sturridge and, and you know, reinventing Gerrard as a as a defensive midfielder and you know the emergence of Sterling. You know, that was the second half of that season was you know, certainly until the one we've just had was was the best football I've seen from a Liverpool team. Um and then Klopp again different because it's certainly very different to Rogers in terms of you know he was universally loved from the second he arrived so um you know you you then under under Klopp kind of I think he just sees all the written press probably in kind of one pool so mm-hmm. when he does separate newspaper stuff over the last you know what is it getting on for four years it tends to be all the newspapers together as opposed to separate time for local and and national but no, I, mean, I think the amazing thing with Klopp is, it, you know, you meet him the first few times, and you know, there's a there's a real aura to him, and he he just seems to have the knack of saying the right thing at the right time, and and you kind of thought, okay, you know, give it time. Is it is is this guy? You know, he can't be as good as he seems he is. It's too good to be true almost, and he can't possibly live up to all the hype. But you know, the biggest compliment you could pay him is. It really, yeah, he really has yeah. lived. He's he's everything that everyone thought they were getting back in October 2015 and more. Because you know, and what what I love about him more than anything is he's he's very very genuine. Like you know, he, you know whether whether the you know, there's a camera on him or not. You know when when you speak to him after the dictaphones are turned off, you know he, he's just incredibly natural. And I think that's one of his you know, massive qualities in terms of being able to get the best out of people because, you know, football at times isn't can can be not a particularly honest business, but he is, you know, very, very honest. People know exactly where they stand with him. Um he calls things as he as he sees them. Um, you know, a man of huge in integrity. Um and yeah, what he's created at Liverpool is, you know, uh just absolutely remarkable. Well Apart from those managers, then who are the people that you've really enjoyed interviewing? The people that you've had great relationships with during your time covering Liverpool? Yeah, I mean, I think you know the. I don't, I don't think you're getting better than Steven Gerrard for, for for interviews. Probably closely followed by by Jamie Carragher, yeah. just because I think you know it, it, it's probably become harder and harder over the years to to really get a player to say what he thinks about something, and you know, in an era of you know, kind of media training and yeah. and players being wanting to be very careful about not saying the wrong thing. You know, we all see. You know, f- football interviews can be quite bland at times. But you know, the, the amazing thing with with Gerard was, you know, you just knew that if you, you know, three minutes with him at that time was probably worth twenty minutes with any, yeah. with anyone else because he would inevitably give you, a, you know, a, a great line. I remember there was it was after and there was a different Merseyside derby actually at Goodison where. It was the one when Phil Neville got booked for. I think he got booked for diving, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, and, um, I remember that one. And it was. I think it was. He, he literally. Gerard stopped for. I think it was about two and a half minutes in this corridor, just mm. where they go out of Goodison to get on the bus. And in that two and a half minutes, like he, you know, he'd, he'd had a massive pop at Phil Neville for diving. He, you know, he'd had a go at Moyes because I think it was in the build-up to the game. Moyes had, had basically warned the ref to beware of Suarez diving. Yeah. He'd also got a dig in about how um, playing Everton was great preparation for the the next away game at Stoke because they also play long ball and all this. And you were just like, and it's like when you're listening to it back, <laughs> thinking, oh my god, there's like three or four absolutely belting lines here. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there's been some. You know, even Suarez didn't do an awful lot, but I mean, but I got to do one kind of one-to-one sit down with him and, you know, fascinating character, you know, very different off the pitch yeah. compared to the, to what he was like on it, you know, like a real quiet, humble guy. Like when you sat down with him, you know, and um, compared to, you know, the, the man possessed that you you see on, on the field, um, you know, Jordan Henderson has always been, you know, incredibly generous with his time and, yeah. You know, a huge amount of respect for him. Just more than anything, the way that he he's handled everything that's been been thrown at him over the last eight years, and you know that was one of the the most satisfying things in Madrid. I think to for, you know nobody deserved that moment more than him. Um, but I think I think that's when I think back over the over the time and you know all the players you 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 speak to. Um, you know, I think the, the the it makes you like the, the current team is just full of of great people as as well as fantastic players because um 
you know, you're thinking like, you know, Andy Robertson, you know, just, and you, you take, I take a lot of personal satisfaction for just how much you see how much it means to him to play for Liverpool yeah. and, yeah. you know, the way that, you know, even, you know, the way that he deals with the media after games, it's, you know, it's almost that, that feeling of, you know, it means so much to him to be a Liverpool player that you know, he want he wants to do the, the, the media stuff and, um, but, uh, yeah, there's been, <laughs> I suppose, you know, the the hardest ones are the ones that, the, the say very very little and you know and, and you do meet like the ones I remember there was well I think I must it must have been it must have been when I was filling in for for one of the guys before I started permanently and I remember it was I think it was not long after Kyriakos had signed so it was obviously when Benitez was was in charge and it was with a kind of a Greek interpreter and uh, and he said oh he want Soto wants to say something before we start and uh, and it was translated as um, he does not like journalists. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, oh, well, that's a, we're going to get on great then. That was uh, thankfully he didn't really stay around long enough for that to no, be a, no. um, a a massive problem. Um, but uh, but no, but you know, by and large, it's been a you know a you know there's been it's been a lot of great great people been lucky enough to to speak to. Okay, well, what perhaps has been maybe maybe that one with Soto, but what's been your toughest interview or perhaps your toughest day on the job? <laughs> Probably a lot of probably. T- I mean, the hardest interviews are definitely the ones that the, <laughs> that you're desperately trying to like you, you drain some kind of you know information or opinion about anything on. I mean, probably it was obviously just coming back to the club now. Probably his stay will be pretty brief. But Nathaniel Klein is is very <laughs> hard work. The uh, I remember doing a round the table chat with him. There was probably eight or nine of us probably not long after he joined and uh, it was one of those ones where usually if you only get 10 15 minutes it can be difficult to get a, a word in edgeways of everyone's yeah. trying to ask questions yeah. but it was one of them ones where the answers were so so short and he clearly did, didn't really want to be there that one by one people were kind of dropping out to the point where i think it got kind of they called a, a line under it about seven minutes in where everyone was like yeah i think we've got we've probably had enough of this the uh um and uh, you know, a lovely, lovely fella. But you know, Joel Matip, I'd say, is a man of a few words. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, it, you know, it can be difficult to, to to have to you know to have a lengthy a lengthy interview with with him. Um, you know, going back before that, like Daniel Agger, absolutely, you know, absolutely love love Daniel Agger. You know, what a player he was, yeah, and yeah. great fella to have around. But he did this funny thing where you'd ask him a question, and then he'd he'd take ages thinking about it. And, and like kind of take a deep breath and you almost, it was like 15, 20 seconds down the line and you're thinking, do I ask something else? Is it like, is he just like <laughs> not going to answer that? And then I think, and um, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, obviously so so many different personalities that, that, um, that, that you come across and, you know, Roberto Firmino, you know, lovely fella but you know every single week will say give you a beaming smile and say no 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 and then in fact after the 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 uh, the Champions League final in Madrid you know a few a few of us said you know come on Roberto surely tonight you've got as we said okay okay uh so we stopped and said oh how does it feel you know you're you're uh, you're a Champions League winner and he uh, he said, "Oh, I'm just so so happy. Just want to thank all my teammates, thank the manager, and thank the fans. Goodbye." And just got off. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it finally got him to yeah. stop after all those years. And then we got about twelve seconds of Firmino. I think that was the extent of the interview. Um, I probably in terms of hard days in the job. Probably uh, one of the hardest things I found was really early on when you know I'd only been in the job probably maybe eight eight maybe nine months when the Suarez Everest stuff kicked off. Oh, yeah. And, you know, for someone, you know, I had to hold my hand up to admit that I probably didn't, you know, I would do things differently now than yeah. I did then because, you know, that was just a massively complex, you know, case to try and get your head around. And, you know, you're trying to be fair to everyone. You're trying to take on board, you know, what what the club and what the, you know, what people are saying. And, you know, then, then you're getting accused of condoning racism and you yeah. think, well, I'm not trying to not condone racism, but... You know, we don't know exactly what he's what's been yeah. said, and um, so that was that was really really hard. Um, yeah, Suarez is I'd say Suarez has probably ruined more family meals over the years than anyone else, and just just you know, and then you know, biting Ivanovic, where yeah. just just that feeling of God, you know, that just you, know, you just never your first thought is like, well, that's it, that's 
and that's that's not even just the rest of my day today wrecked that's the next week in terms of you know the repercussions of that and um yeah and probably you know obviously the the, the long transfer sagas trying yeah. to you know i think i remember you know flying into australia on a pre-season tour and and you're absolutely done in after all the traveling and then suddenly you get wind of the fact that you know the arsenal have bid 40 million plus a pound and and then obviously with the time difference then you find yourself staying up all night again mm. to try and you know trying to speak to people in the uk trying to speak to people that have just flown into australia that don't really want to speak to you and um so yeah i'd say probably those those sagas and like yeah tr- just the, when you, you you're getting bombarded and you know there's a obviously pressure on you to to deliver stories but you you know by the same token you're desperate to try and ensure that it's absolutely spot on and, yeah. and accurate and stuff the um yeah they're probably the hardest ones yeah well you mentioned pre-season so we'll, we'll keep it there um i know you've got some funny season <laughs> stories from pre-season and, and on the road so <laughs> Um, you've you've adopted kids. You've you've done everything on preseason <laughs> tours. And- <laughs> yeah, that was probably the strangest one. I think that that was in that was in St Louis a few years ago, where um, yeah, this lady asked me if I could uh, adopt her child MJ. Yeah, and would I be prepared to stay in St Louis and help bring him up? And when I explained I had two kids of my own and probably needed to get back to them, um, she said, "Well, is there anything you can do to help me bring MJ up?" And have you had any she contact just, with MJ since? <laughs> no, no, that, the uh, the line's gone cold. No, the um, but yeah, that was that was a bit that was a bit surreal, and um, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, suddenly, <laughs> suddenly found yeah, suddenly it was that was myself and Dave Maddox from the the Mirror who <laughs> found ourselves yeah. in this this bar in St Louis, and um, yeah, with this this quite crazy lady who then um, turned out that her boyfriend was there had, had not long out not long come out of prison having served a lengthy sentence for for killing someone. And that, um, <laughs> and they were having a domestic row while you're trying to like, oh, no, 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 let's, let's not get carried away thinking. I don't really want this fella kicking off, and this would be a bad way to end the tour. If, uh, <laughs> and having to let her down gently, that I definitely can't bring a bring a kid up. So yeah. Um, yeah, that and you know some of the the ones in Australia are really good. Like you know, seeing Colo Torre run away from a koala bear, <laughs> <laughs> like like it was an alien that had just landed, and then and then and then at a press conference justify it by saying he just he doesn't doesn't like animals and that <laughs> he's had a dog at home for six years but he just he, he hasn't even touched that because uh <laughs> he, yeah he, he doesn't like them um but uh yeah you know being trapped like being stuck in a monsoon in bangkok and suddenly your you, you, your your laptop's getting absolutely drenched and you're having to you know try and battle your way through eighty thousand people and to try and find somewhere that you can watch the rest of the game whilst doing your report and just yeah, you just you find yourself in some crazy spots. I remember I probably bro- I've bro- probably broken every single health and safety <laughs> rule that I'd signed up to at the Echo in terms of. I remember even in Bangkok another another time when the traffic was just absolutely gridlocked and I was going to miss the game and ended up getting a lift off just a fella on a motorbike, obviously no helmet or anything, just we- you're just weaving in and out of the <laughs> traffic and and you- you're thinking, yeah, I'm not. You know, when when you have to fill out your health and safety form before you do any foreign travel, and <laughs> they even like make you. You know, you know, agree that you'll drink water in hot places to avoid dehydration and wear sun cream. And but they didn't say anything about taking lifts on mopeds off, off. Uh, You're just doing job. strange, <laughs> off yeah. strangers who don't have uh, who don't have helmets. So, um, but uh, yeah, all uh, all adds to the memories. There must have been a few um, embarrassing moments along the way. Oh God, yeah, probably. Yeah, I try. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, but yeah, but I think. Obviously, you make yeah, you do make certainly some mistakes that um, that people you know, don't 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 especially in like the internet age now where everything is so easy to find. It's different, isn't it, compared to yeah. you know the the days of the newspapers where you know within a day or two they just kind of like disappeared yeah, and yeah. You know, unless you had like some kind of archive. But um, but yeah, I think um, yeah, there's, there's <laughs> probably too too many to want to want to record. I think probably one of the one of the one of the ones that people sometimes still hit me with that um, that I must admit I, I wish I hadn't done was when Balotelli swapped shirts at halftime oh, yeah, against yeah. Real Madrid in the Champions yeah. League, and um, it wasn't my idea. I must admit to to <laughs> then do a comment piece, basically talk, calling him a disgrace for swapping shirts at halftime. Um, but it went on the back page the following day under the, the big banner headline yeah. apologize and 
yeah, it's it's just that thing, is it? Because you, you've got such a short period on, an, especially on a night game, yeah. where you have to try. It's, you're trying to tap into the mood and think, you know, what from this game will fans be talking about? And you know, I think that was an example of getting it spectacularly wrong. Where you know, after getting hammered by Real Madrid in the Champions League, nobody was really asked about the fact that Balotelli had swapped shirts at half time. That was a a very minor sideshow. You know, what what was you know, a bigger concern was the fact that Liverpool had there was this huge golf in class and that Real Madrid had effectively declared in the second half and just and just gone easy on on Rogers' side. So um I think yeah there's those ones where you have to you make so many kind of snap judgment calls, don't you? And then you 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 kind of then you know you, you kind of know you're not going to get everything right. I mean even even with the the Fakir thing last yeah. summer where you know it's you know, transfers are notoriously difficult because, you know, people, you know, e- even in recent months, people will throw out like, oh, but you said we weren't signing Allison last last season. And then when they when they kind of show you, well, hang on a minute, where was the link? They give it to you. But it was like, well, that was in February. You know, Liverpool signed him in the June when in the February, Roma wanted 90 million quid. So, you know, that obviously, tra- you know, things can change so quickly. And, you know, with the Fakir thing, I'd never known a, a deal like that where, you know, he, he'd, he'd done his... He'd done all of his in you know in house media introductory stuff and interviews with the club and um, you know everyone in France was saying it was a it was a done deal and even even when you know I got I got the information that Liverpool were concerned about something with his knee from one of the scans the, the, the same contact said but you know don't worry they've sought a second opinion and they think it will still go through and then. You know, for for whatever whatever it was, Liverpool then when they weighed it all up, decided it was too big a risk, and and when you've kind of said that you you know your ninety nine percent sure is going to happen when it doesn't happen, then obviously you're left with yeah. with egg on your face. But um, you know, all you can all you can try and do is try and get a few more right than than you than you get wrong um, in the knowledge that you know, people will always <laughs> people will always remind you about the ones that uh, the ones that didn't come off. Well, social media has changed the game, hasn't it, in terms of... And, and you've probably lived through it because it was on the rise when you, you became Liverpool reporter. And, and, I mean, I don't know, how many 250,000 followers, something like that, you've got now? 470,000, yeah. I, I yeah, apologise. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, Doing yeah. me down there. Yeah, but. sorry, sorry. But, I mean, it. how do you deal with that in a day? I've, I've never seen someone's phone go off so much. I'm surprised. Have you turned that off? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, was I, was say, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've never seen someone's phone go off so much. Someone gets so many memes and... and <laughs> Pictures with your <laughs> face put up and um, put on it. I mean, how do you deal with that on a daily basis? And who, yeah, are, the, who are the weirdest people um, <laughs> you, you, you come across on social media? Yeah, I suppose that's one of the biggest. You know, in terms of big changes in the job since since like 2011 to here, I suppose like the you know the probably the, the first biggest change is the, the shift from print to 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 the website. Because yeah. my, my working day used to be, be you know, you'd come in in the morning. And, and whoever was mapping out, you know, usually like 10 or 11 pages of sport, right? We're going to have three pages of Liverpool. Yeah. You know, what? how are you going to fill that? And then, you know, usually you'd have a couple of things lined up anyway. Well, yeah. that, that would be a double page spread. Yeah. We'll get a line for the back. That can, yeah. and obviously, and once you'd kind of fill, you know, those pages, that was it. Your day was done. And then suddenly with the shift to the website, it's, it, you know, it's, it's an absolute game changer in terms of, you know, having suddenly having like six, seven, eight different web spikes a yeah, day. Yeah. You know, all the podcasts we do now, yeah. um, the video content, and yeah, and then yeah, and then built into that is the the rise of social media, and and that, you know, and how important it is to to obviously to. I think it certainly it certainly helped helped me a lot in terms of doing the job. In terms of, I know Twitter's probably not a great gauge of fan opinion in general because I think you get a lot of extremes yeah. on, on, on Twitter but it has been great in terms of having that engagement with people and um, yeah it was I mean it's, yeah, it's just all a bit it, it's, it's surreal in a way because I think a lot of people just appreciate taking the time to to answer their questions and 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 to feel as if that you know they have have got that direct direct route into yeah. into someone that's that's covering the club on a on a daily basis and you know probably the downside of it is is the abuse which you know yeah, yeah. I, again I can't read out some of the, some <laughs> of the I have taken screen grabs over the years of some of the most yeah. abusive probably not to press charges but just for my own uh, <laughs> just for my own album yeah. and some of the things I've been accused of and uh and yeah accused of putting strange things in strange places but um <laughs> the uh 
you know, no one really prepares you for that. That was, you know, I think, you know, when when you when you're doing the journalism training, I was did one well, like twenty years ago now. You know, no no one said you needed a thick skin because you're going to get absolutely bombarded with abuse on the, on social media at times. But yeah, I think that just over time you just you learn to laugh it off. And I found as well with a lot of people, you know, if even the ones that were the most abusive, if you actually can say to them, you know, what do you mean by that? You're like, you know, before I block you, what on earth? And then, and the nine times out of ten, they say, "I'm just really, I'm, si- I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to call yeah. you that. I'm just a bit frustrated because we haven't signed X, Y, and Z or whatever." And, um, but it has, it, you know, it, I'd, I'd say the positives still massively outweigh the the negatives in terms of you know the the people I've met via yeah. social media and you know the the, the 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 relationships that you've built and. You, you kind of sense it probably more when you go on the tours and stuff because, um, you know, it was just, just it, you know, very surreal when, I think it, I think it was in, in Bangkok when uh, I think I was with one of our photographers, it might have been, might have been Colin Lane, and we're, um, we're having breakfast at the table and then you realise there's like 10 Liverpool fans queued up by your table <laughs> wanting selfies after you finished your breakfast and it was... Yeah, and you, the number of times like, I said to fans like over there, like when they'll ask you to sign a shirt or something, and you're going, no, no, like I will devalue that shirt if I sign <laughs> it. You really, really do not want me to sign that shirt, and you know, like I've got, you, you, you've you've got some nice signatures on there already, don't, and and then like, you know, and then they say like you're refusing to sign it. And you're like, oh, no, no, I'm not. And then then you suddenly find yourself in that predicament where you're like, am I more of an idiot to sign it, or am I more of an idiot to actually say no and and walk away? And it's um. But yeah, so that you know, the, the the rise in social media is yeah has been has 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 been crazy. But it's you know it's definitely de- definitely benefited me in terms of my career in terms of you know in terms of you know the profile obviously that yeah. you're able to to build up and yeah. But you've just I think it, that's one of the new probably facets to football writing in the last five or six years that. You know, if, if you haven't got a thick skin, then there's, then uh, social media is probably not for you. Yeah, well, there can't be many journalists who receive high quality illustrations uh, <laughs> printed and sent to the office, which uh, which I opened the other week for you. Uh, I mean, it, it is totally bizarre. Look, we'll finish off with uh, some quick fire questions. Yeah. Um, so easy, easy enough. Best player you've seen? Best player. I mean, it would have to be Steven Gerrard in terms of most complete player. Um, but you know, an honourable honourable mentions you have to have for for Suarez. Yeah. Just you know, he, he did things. You know that just that wow factor of you, know, you think about what he did to Norwich. Yeah. <laughs> just on more than Poor one Norwich. occasion. <laughs> just you know, just that. Oh my God! You know, yeah. scoring a header from almost outside the box. Didn't yeah. he? It was against West, West Brom, Brom, and yeah. you know, and, and then you know, in recent you'd put Salah in that. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd put Salah in that bracket with Suarez as well, and you know, probably, and now Mane and Van Dijk. Um, not not far behind them, you know. It's, but yeah, I think in in terms of most complete player and, you know, just just that sense of, of witnessing a talent that you just know you're going to remember forever and people will still be talking about in seventy, eighty years time. I think it would have to be Gerard. Best opposition player. <sighs> Best opposition player. Um, I mean, it's a boring one, but you probably have to say Messi in I terms of that. just, yeah. just you know, in that in that first leg of the the semi final, you know, some of the things he did, he did that night, just just absolutely um, incredible. Um, yeah, you'd have to go for him. All right, worst player. <sighs> um, a bit nasty, maybe, but yeah, no, I think, I mean. Probably Paul Konchesky from the the <laughs> from the, 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 the when I when I was f- f- doing it briefly bef- obviously before I became the, the the Liverpool reporter and then probably since then I mean I probably have Ali Sissoko. Oh, in, um, well, just, he put that cross in for that brilliant header from Suarez. Oh, Picked know, him out <laughs> outside yeah, the box. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think yeah, can, uh, and you'd probably find a, Christian Poulsen wouldn't be far <laughs> off either. Like that was. So all the usual it, suspects. wasn't exactly a golden a golden period, was no, it? That no. that that uh, that Hodgson team. Best goal, pick one. <sighs> oh God, best goal. Do you know what? I think I would probably. Go, I mean, I absolutely loved some of Salah's. The what? The, the, I mean, the, the one he slalomed through against Tottenham. Oh, that was good. 
you know, I think that, and even you know, the one against Chelsea, you know, uh, not long ago, you know, the, the bullet into the top corner, and but I think I don't know if I, and then and in terms of celebrating goals, I mean, you'd have to you'd have to have an honourable mention for Divock Origi just with, you know, the 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 the, the, uh, the one against Everton, the last minute, and then. Obviously, the the one in the one in Madrid, just the, that 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 pure relation that that triggered. But if I was going for one, I would actually go for. I think it was the night when Suarez got four against Norwich. I think it was the first one when he hit it, when it just oh. sat up for him, and it must have been like forty yards or something ridiculous. And just the way it just dipped, you know, beyond Ruddy. But you know, and that was that was a that was a strange night that night because I think it was a, it was freezing cold. It was January, and there was. Um, I ended up having an old lady stuck in my car for about an hour <laughs> on the way home where um, the uh, it was I was driving down Lodge Lane and there was this little old lady like slumped in the bus shelter. And it, it, by this point, it was, it was like gone midnight and it was like well under minus. And um, so I ended up thinking, oh, God, I'm going to have to. Uh, so I pulled in, went and saw her. And I think she was a bit worse for wear she was in, in her 80s or something. And uh, so. So in, and she was just she she just kept saying to me, "Can you buy me cigarettes?" And I said, I, "I can't buy you cigarettes, but I can give you a lift home." And she just kept, "But can you buy me?" No, no, we're not getting cigarettes. I'm going to take you home. So I ended up having to like carry her into this Nissan Qashqai, which was a bit difficult. She was quite a big lady. And then when I got her in the car, I said, "Oh, where am I taking to you to?" And all she would say was, "Where are my cigarettes?" <laughs> and so I ended up thinking, "I'm now stuck in a car with a little old lady." At, gone midnight and she won't tell me where she lives and uh, and then she was saying i live near, near a park so what near sefton park no not <laughs> sefton park and then rattling off other parks around liverpool and uh yeah it was i was on the brink of taking her to a police station thinking i don't really know what else to do with this old lady i really need to go home and then finally she gave me a road name and i was able to uh take her home so uh yeah i always remember that suarez four goals against norwich for <laughs> For a number of different reasons, yeah, Joe. I, I, when I asked you about best goal, I didn't expect you <laughs> to tell me about the time you picked up an old lady we at off, midnight. We went <laughs> off on a tangent. <laughs> yeah, we certainly did. Um, well, best match? Oh, um, oh, it would have to be the 4 0 against Barcelona, just because yeah. I know Ian Doyle here, Doyle here did a piece earlier on this week mm-hmm. about kind of how it, it almost feels like it got lost amidst you know what was an incredible season. And yeah. I think I'd go along with that just because, I mean, I, I think as a lot of people here will know, I'm, I'd like to think I'm an eternal optimist and like try and look on the, the bright side of most things. But I must admit, I drove to Anfield that night thinking this is not happening. Yeah. Just mainly because I just thought Barcelona would sc- score, Liverpool aren't going to get five and, and that will that will just kill it. But um, yeah, just, I, I just, you know, there's been so many amazing ones over the years that, um, but yeah, that I just, that was just perfect, wasn't it? When you yeah. just when you factor in everything, just how good that Barcelona team is, the fact they had Messi, you know, the greatest player in world football, Liverpool being without two of their star men, Barcelona had the weekend off, Liverpool had that grueling game up at Newcastle, um, and just when the goals came, and you know, just just everything, everything about that that night was just just so so special, and you know, and then you, you know when you when you speak to people that have been going to Anfield for many more decades than me and 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 they describe that as the greatest night they've ever had at Anfield like you know wow well, yeah you know it's it's not just it's not just me that, that you know that that's that's something that you know I, I don't even know if it's realistic to think that I'll ever be beaten in our in our lifetimes well I've since read your your verdicts from the first leg and the second leg back to back and I, I recommend doing that it's a satisfying <laughs> experience um worst match oh I think most embarrassing would have to be the 6-1 at yeah. Stoke, yeah. Um, I think you'd have to give a mention to the home defeat to Wolves at the back end of Hodgson's time. I remember that was an absolutely bleak, bleak day at Anfield. That, um, but yeah, just just in terms of just just the sheer embarrassment, I think of you know, to, especially with it being Stephen Gerrard's farewell as well. That just added to that sense of humiliation that mm. someone so special and someone who'd given so much to the club. Should have to be part of something quite so shim- shambolic as as that. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think losing six one at Stoke would uh, would have to be that one. And that's end with uh, your proudest moment in your career covering Liverpool. Um, proudest moment. I think 
I think it would have to, it would probably have to be being able to say that I wrote the match report on Liverpool winning the, the European Cup for the sixth time because, um, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I, I was in a position going into the final where I, I kind of knew that a new opportunity had, had come up and that, that, I, that, I, that I might be moving on. Um, and, you know, a, a kind of that feeling of, you know, how nice would it be to be able to, to go out on a high and, you know, and it doesn't get any any better than being able to, to say that you know to frame that match report and say you know this yeah. you know, I was able to, to 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 write the echo report when they lifted the European Cup. Um, so yeah, it's been you know just been an absolute privilege to 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 have done the job for as long as I have done. Um, very very lucky to have worked with so many uh, in- incredible reporters over the years um, and and be able to you know call people that. You know, I grew up idolising kind of friends. That's one of the most surreal things of being in this job for for so long. Um, but uh, but yeah, and now uh, yeah, a, a kind of now a new chapter awaits. But um, yeah, I know I've loved every every minute of covering Liverpool for this club, and you know the fact that you know they're in such great shape at the moment just just whets your appetite for the the months and years to come. Do you want to sign off with one last message to the Nets Ben boys? <laughs> I, I get enough stick on, the, on social media without in, enraging any more of them. So uh, no, the uh, I think even the Nets Ben boys quietened down a bit last season, didn't they? With although they, yeah. with the lack of activity this summer, maybe they'll, uh, they'll be back. They'll be they'll be back with uh, with a vengeance. But yeah, I think those ones and the uh, the John Acterberg bashers and the, the Henderson <laughs> bashers. The um, so the, no, I think it just. You know, I think there's been a positivity abounds, doesn't it? Because um, you know, the, the 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 greatest thing I think about Madrid as well is the fact that you sense it is just the start of something. It, it wasn't one of those ones where if it didn't, you know, it, with 2013, 14, you kind of felt that was like a one-off shot for that team. They were, you know, there was players in that team that probably shouldn't be anywhere near to winning the Premier League title and never to be re- repeated. But you know, when you look at the age of this team and what Klopp has built. You know, I I fully expect that whoever the lucky man is that that takes on this job for me, they'll um they'll, they'll have some uh, some iconic nights of their own to report on. Lovely. Well, that's it, um, James. Thanks very much. It's been emotional. Cheers, Joe. Yeah, shake my hand. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everyone. Ta-ra. Goodbye.